Hi there, uh, welcome to 45 Drives Tech Tips. My name is Doug Milburn. I am co-founder of 45 Drives and a lover of Ceph clustering. And uh, uh, the good folks here at 45 Drive Tech Tips have once again allowed me to get in front of the camera for episode four on introduction to Ceph. Okay, so right off the bat, we talked about how a, a, a cluster strategy diverges from a single server strategy and how you get things like high availability, an infinite path forward in capacity and performance. Right? And we talked about minimum uh, starting, uh, sort of the, the minimums to start a cluster. And uh, we talked about the fact that in Ceph, we have basically a layer of software. It's software defined storage. Okay? The, the stuff's all stored as objects. That doesn't matter. That, that's completely transparent. The Ceph software through something called a crush algorithm manages all your servers and this diagram these are my servers think of the storage bins the storage bins are no matter how many i get they're completely managed by the ceph software there's a, a beautiful dashboard incredibly easy to use dashboard that you administer this thing through so on, on the hardware side of it just add servers you add hard drives go on your dashboard plug them in okay? you don't worry about what's in them totally managed by ceph okay we go up above that and we say, okay, now I need to do something useful for my clients. At the end of the day, it's about providing storage to clients. And uh, how do we do that? We create something in software called pools. Okay, Pools are defined by parameters that, 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 that drive the crush algorithm. Okay, we have uh, one is the redundancy method and the numbers related to that, and uh, which is either replication or erasure coding. Okay? And the other thing is failure domain. Okay. We're limiting our conversation at this point to failure domain server. Why? Because the vast majority of our clientele okay, who go from people, you know, might have 10 or 20 byte terabytes on, on the low end and are really into clustering for high availability up to we have clientele with many, many tens of petabytes uh, that are moving data in at many, many uh, gigabytes per second. So we go right over the, the, the whole end of that. But uh, real interest is usually... Um, it's redundancy at server level. Now, if you're a mega organization, you might go up to rack or data center level redundancies, but uh, most of our people, it's server level. Why? Server level gets you into basic high availability. It gets you to have the ability for one of your servers to go down, one or more of your servers to go down, and for you not to skip a beat, not have a groundhog event. It also uh, frees you up as IT staff, uh, to be able to do maintenance whenever you want, middle of the day, no more coming in at night and weekend and ask people to close files and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So that's, that's where we are. And we talked about these pools. And so what I, I want to talk about some of the, uh, the, the magic things about Ceph, about how it manages stuff. But one of the first things I want to point out is something minimum cluster requirements. Okay. We sell a lot of minimum clusters. People set up a cluster. Why? Because once you set up a cluster, you are on your way. You're, you're now on a track where you, you never have to worry about running out of data. You've got a continuous expansion plan. Okay? And you'll never have service interruptions. Literally never, if you manage it right. Okay? So, but that minimum configuration, Ceph needs three machines. Okay? And typically, all the software that drives it is co-located in those three machines. So you end up with a cluster, no single point of failure in it. Okay, and uh, typically, and if you're really interested, you can just put redundant networking, do a little bit of bonding, multiple network connections, and you have just huge redundancy, failure of a switch, uh, failure of a server, you're completely insulated against it. Okay, so, but this minimal configuration does all that. But let's look at what happens on a minimal, minimal configuration. Okay, so when we start writing in Ceph, and I, I, so I got two pools set up here that I used in the last video. I have pool number one, which is two rep. So data comes in there, okay? One chunk is my data, the other chunk is a replica of my data. So it's a two chunk system, okay? So in pool one, they give me all kinds of nice colored markers, so, and let me at the board. So good, my data comes in and it, I get uh, chunk number one is my data, chunk number two is an identical replica of that, okay? It gets stored, let's say my cluster is empty and they go, okay, let me pick the server that is the least uh, full on a percentage basis, okay? And uh, so it, it, it's any one of these, so it goes into number one. Once it's in number one, okay, failure to main server, it's got to get put somewhere else. It'll go to the, the server, again, with the most available space, but it can't go in the same one, otherwise I lose my redundancy. Okay? So that chunk will get put in over here. Okay, so 
Let's talk about the other share. This is Erasure Coding 2 plus 1. So any data comes in from its clients to that pool to be saved. The Ceph system says take the data, break it up. So if I got a piece of data, break it up into two chunks. Okay. Now I create one other chunk, which is my parity chunk. Okay. That needs to get Store, these need to get stored again uh, based on the crush rule. So the, the rule for this thing says, now, now they have three chunks, go put them through there, uh, go find the server that uh, chunk number one on that is going to go down here because that's got the most space. Uh, number two is going to go down here, doesn't matter, and then my parity chunk is going to go over there. Okay. So again, I'm stored and I'm safe and everything's good. Just note, if I'm largely relying on a three chunk system, note there's no flexibility in where they go. Those three things have to be put in servers. There's only three servers, there's three chunks to go in. So the servers will fill up equally. Okay? So if you're gonna set up a cluster and only run a three chunk pool on it, you'd wanna buy servers that are the same size. Why? Because otherwise you're limited, you're gonna run out of ability to store stuff under those rules the minute your smallest server fills up. Okay, really key point to understand. But here's the really cool thing. This all changes the minute I add another server. So I, now my servers, I'm just uh, putting those as sort of bin, storage bins. Let me let the width of them uh, represent its capacity. Let's say I had an old legacy server. If I want to start off my cluster and I'm going to use, uh, let's say I'm using pool two only, I'm using three wrap, um, then, uh, yeah, let me just get rid of my pool number one. I'm not going to use that right now. So if I go there, if, if I just had three servers, it's going to fill up one, two, three. Next one's going to come on one, two, three. Next one's going to come on one, two, three. It's kind of dull and it's kind of boring. Works. I got high availability, okay? but I don't have any ability, uh, but, but I need, I'm, I'm constrained. I really want to put in symmetric size servers. That'd be a rotten path to have to grow on, right? It'd be, it'd be highly constrained. What if I want to switch to bigger servers for better cost later? And what if I had smaller servers, I had legacy servers that want to plug in my cluster, which is a thing you can do and it's worthwhile if you have any decent legacy server that's smaller, <clears throat> you can join them in your cluster. But you can't do that for your first three if you have three chunk, okay? because they need symmetry. Otherwise, they just have wasted capacity. Not that you can, it's just you waste the extra capacity. The minute I put on another server, that server can be any size. Because now, when, if I come up with another, uh, if I want to store on that again, where is it going to go? First chunk is going to go in this guy because he's got the least in it. Where are the other ones going to go? Well, those ones are all the same. So I get maybe two in there and maybe I get my parity over there. Okay. When I want to store again, my first chunk is going to go in there and it's going to distribute. It's got different ways to distribute that data. So it can use an asymmetrical server. Okay. And... Uh, and, and of course, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of run out if I had a great big server there. I won't, probably won't be able to fill it up all the way, but that's okay. It gets more flexible. The more servers I put, I put on there, the better. And oh yeah, if I'm putting in data from pool number one, which is a two chunk pool, that's got more ways it can, it can put it in there. So the more variety I have in my cluster, the better it works, which is pretty cool. But that's the minimum configuration thing. So let me go from here. I'm going to talk about two other really cool things about Ceph. Let's talk about self-balancing. Okay. Let me go to my representation over here. Let's just... And I am going to say I've started to fill these things up in a serious way. And I'm reading and I'm writing, I'm reading and writing, and you can get an imbalance on that. And, and I'm going to represent the amount of data in these things as a water level. Okay, think of those tanks with water in it. Let's talk about self-balancing. So self-balancing, there's an engine in Ceph that's able to look at how much data is on your servers and to do it in an intelligent way, knowing the crush, what the data is and what the crush rules are for that data. And it's just, it's simple. Self-balancing is just like this. It's just like I connected a water pipe through there. It'll drop the data level in the ones that are full and by shuffle them over to the ones that are less full. Okay, until it achieves, you know, it'll go to as close as balance as it can achieve. You may get in a situation where you're constrained and you can't get perfect balance in it, but it'll get the very best it can. It'll balance that all out and you'll come to an average level. 
and you have control over that, uh, it, 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 there's a flag for, uh, for moving, allowing the system to move data. If you do that, self-balancing, if you, if you turn it on, it will allow data to move from one server to another, and you can do it at a server level. Okay? And it's used, for example, if I'm doing maintenance on a server, I shut off data movement on it. Okay? Um, and uh, I can flip that back, do my go do my maintenance, and then flip my data movement back on. Uh, one interesting thing, if I wanted to add a new server to my cluster, okay, say I put on a great big whopping server on there, first thing I do is shut off data movement until I got it in there. And the minute I flip it on, data is going to rush from those ones over to that one to try to balance everything up. But I actually have control. I have a switch that I can control my maximum rate of data movement because you don't want that going full speed because it'll use up all your all your CPU bandwidth. So, uh, so you throttle that back to something reasonable when you're way out of balance. You come back into balance, you can flip that up, turn it up a little more and let it go a little harder at self-balancing. Okay, and, and these are Realize these are, are, I'm talking a very, very conceptual level and they are oversimplifications. And uh, this actually got much, much more complexity when you actually have to do it. But it, it just understand it, you know, if you want to think about Ceph, you want to think about architecting a system to, uh, you know, or adopting Ceph and doing initial system architecture and think about where you want to go. It's good to know about these things. So let's talk about one other, my last thing I want to talk about in this video is uh, self-healing. Okay. So I'm going to go back to a very simple representation of my data and I'll go with this cluster that now has five servers on it. There. Okay. And let's say it's really simple. I have my pool one data which is, is two reps so this is two chunk data up here. Okay. And I'm going to represent this in pink. So I got two chunk data that went in here. So, so there, there, there's file number one. Here's file number two, happened to get put here. File number three in pink went here. Okay, and I could put it, fill up as many of those as I wanted. So my green pool, it's a three chunk system. So I got uh, 1A goes here. 1B goes here, one parity goes there. So this would be my first file in that system. And let me go to my second one. Okay, I store something else. So my second file, I got the first part of it. It'll go here because that's the least used. They're all looking pretty balanced, so they're just going to go here. So there's the next chunk of that and my parity chunk. So I call it 2P, 1P. Okay. So you get what I'm uh, talking about here, and that's all I need to do. Let's say disaster strikes, okay? And uh, there is, uh, I don't know, sunspot activity, and zap, and rays come from motor space, and a cosmic ray hits the CPU of this server. So this server is suddenly struck dead. Ouch! Ow! Okay. And normally, if you're on a single server strategy, you're going, oh, I got, I'm, I'm down, I got to go see what I can recover, and I got to do it on an emergency basis. And you go, nah, your SAF system notifies you. You go in the dashboard, you have notifications, gives you a text that says, yeah, one of my servers went down. You go, ah, darn, one of my servers went down. Okay. But I've set self-healing on. So what's self-healing? Well, you know, this thing can go back, and uh, I have a piece of, uh, and, and it can rebuild my data on other servers, right? And you go, okay, so what did I lose? So on there, I have file two in this pool. Okay, there's a chunk of file two in that, or a replica of that. But I have the original over there, or one of the replicas. There's no such thing as the original, they're just both replicas. So I got one replica there. So I gotta go, and I, I, I know it was stored there, and I know the server's down, it's inaccessible. Easy problem. I just go and I look, okay, which is my next most available server? It doesn't matter, I got three of them. So I take file two. I take that other chunk of it. Let me stay in my true to my color scheme here. So I'll take that and I will reproduce that. I don't have to move it over there, but I just reproduce it. Why? Because I got it over there. So I'll make it over there. I'm now healed. I now am, am, am faithful to my crush rules for that pool. Okay. So that guy's looked after. I got number three. There's one piece of it over there. Good. Let me create another piece. Where am I going to create it? Oh, look at that guy. That's my least filled. So I'll take that. I will move him over there and I'll have chunk three over there. 
and I have uh, a piece number two, a, a piece of file number two from this pool, from my green pool. Okay. So what do I have for file number two? I have two parity here, and I have chunk one of that. I can recreate chunk two by using my parity math. So I do that, and I, okay, where am I going to recreate him? Which is the least full uh, right there? Is it going to go there? No. Nope. Why not? Because I got chunk two over there. I can't put its parity in the same server. So it says that one's out. Where else do I have chunk two? I have two parity there. That one's out. So I got to pick the best out of these two. Okay. So no problem. Uh, I, I do chunk two of file number two. Goes in there. That's it. I am healed. Okay. So that's it. That is conceptually oversimplified. That is how a cluster can self-heal. That is how a cluster self-balances. Okay. And uh, like this controls over everything and you can set these things. What do you need yet? Minimum cluster, I need three machines. I need three machines to, to have three copies of the Ceph software running. That, that, I can't do any less than that. Now I can have, you know, a non-replicated, that, that's a one chunk system. I can have a two chunk system with two rep and I can get to a three chunk system. These, the simplest one of those is, is uh, EC2 plus one. If I'm into a three chunk system on a three server system. A lot of my flexibility disappears. It can't self heal. There's no place to put those recreated, the, 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 the recreated data. It, it doesn't exist. You can't do that. And sorry, you can actually recreate it, but you can't do it in a way that maintains your failure domain. Okay, so you're constrained there. So, but once you get, oh yeah, and things have to be symmetrical, right? Otherwise you get orphaned capacity. Okay. However, the minute you start putting extra servers on, this stuff all changes. So, uh, and, and particularly it changes for the good as you put larger servers uh, on there as, as, you, as you add up. Although it's still a value to put in a smaller legacy server on top of that. So anyway, I really think Ceph is just such a cool system, that whole idea. The storage bins contain objects. What are objects? Well, they're chunks of data. But you don't care about it. Why? Managed by Ceph software. And what you care about is these pools. You create them, you set up the rules, you set up the failure domain level, you set up the shares, and it's dead easy. Okay? And done through a dashboard, a GUI, um, and uh, you do them as per your requirements. Why would I do that? I don't know. I might have archival data that I, I want really high, uh, really high storage efficiency on. Uh, Good. Once my cluster gets up there, I can create an erasure coded pool. Once I get a large number of servers, I can do an EC with a big first number on it. It becomes very storage efficient. Not a lot of redundancy on it, but it's pretty storage efficient. And at the same time, I could have, I could have uh, three rep data because I got mission critical data that I can never lose. And I can do those all inside the same system. And never, again, never be worried about taking a specific server up or down or anything like that and what data is on it and who's using it or anything like that. That is gone. That is a thing of the past. So it's just absolutely liberating uh, software to find storage running on good, solid enterprise level uh, equipment is wonderful. Okay. And we at 45 Drives, that's what we do. We provide the solution and we will sell you the hardware. Uh, we will pre-configure the software for you, pre-install it, uh, and we will take you through every part of the process um, including working out at client level to share everything and we'll get it all up and running with you. And you can buy any part that you want from us. You don't have to buy full packages or anything like that. No license fees and uh, yeah, and a pretty good model to look at if you want to go on this or you can do it yourself and we're there for you anytime you need, anytime you need to call us. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching this uh, final series of our intro to Seth and uh, yeah, please, if you have any questions, leave them below. We'll be, uh, we'll be maintaining that. And uh, give us a call or an email if you want to talk about your storage needs. Thank you very much.